Welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church. My name is Jan Schley, and I have the delightful privilege this morning of co-leading this service with our guest, Reverend Emily Gordon of Leaside United Church. Emily is here as part of our sharing in a pulpit exchange with the churches of the North Toronto Cluster, the United Churches of the Cluster. Emily has been the minister at Leaside since 2016 and is a gifted liturgist. We welcome all of you today in your giftedness. You enhance our life together and we're grateful for you. We hope to enhance your life as well, welcoming you in all of your joys and sorrows, brilliance and challenges. We welcome you for who you are as you are. We also acknowledge the sacred land on which our church building stands. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Con Confederacy, the Confederacy of the Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community, in this territory. We're also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. The original nations continue to cry out for justice. As treaty people, we commit to listen, learn, and work towards justice and reconciliation. They went to Jesus and he asked them, who do you say I am? They answered, you are the eschatological manifestation of the ground of our being, the kerygma through which we find meaning in our interpersonal relationship. And Jesus said, Faith doesn't have to be that hard. Sometimes we just have to live God's love. Sometimes we just have to live what we believe. Wind riding God the blue skies, the sunshine, the cool breezes cradling falling leaves. All creation reminds us of the delicate artist who has shaped us and all that is around us. Calling Jesus, you humble our arrogance with your acts of mercy. You tip over our pretensions with your modest nature. You laugh at our hunger for power with your words of grace. Heart-keeping spirit, you bear our prayers to the throne of grace when they are only whispers in our souls. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark in chapter 10. In your bulletin, you'll see that the verses for this week are 35 to 45, but I'm actually going to start a few verses earlier. Now, <laughs> in my reflection in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And because of that, I'm going to warn you right now what the questions are. So we're ready. Um, the, the, the sermon title is From Fear to Feast. So we're approaching this scripture 
with the hypothesis that maybe there is fear in the words of James and John that we'll hear. So you're invited to think about this. What might James and John be afraid of? And then you can expand that to, what are you afraid of? What's that thing that's holding you back from following Jesus? And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism which, <laughs> with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. May we find wisdom in these words from Holy Scripture.
It is wonderful to be joining you this morning to be reflecting on how what each of us does in our individual communities of faith is part of something much bigger. And the first words to hear are, we are not alone in what we're doing. It's not this little bubble is the only thing that's happening to share the good news of Jesus. And that commitment to faithful living that we take part in as part of the United Church of Canada. And so the opportunity to uh, have this pulpit swap with, the, with other of the North Toronto cluster of churches is a chance to remember that. Remember that we're in this together. And whenever we talk about being together, that together we can accomplish more than we can do alone. So... Cam and I have known each other for a long time. I don't know if he's mentioned this, but long, long ago in 2015, we worked in the same building because I was doing supply ministry with Trinity St. Paul's and he was doing supply ministry with Bathurst Street United Church and we shared a building. So we got to meet each other then and then found out that at the time we lived two blocks apart in a completely different part of the city. Uh, so it was, it was nice to get to know him then and to continue our friendship over the years since then. And this lovely little gift to be here with you uh, while Cam is elsewhere. And uh, lovely to be here with this community. Many of you uh, do know who I am because you've taken part in my Lenten emails over one or more of the past years. Um, if you're interested in that, well, Lent's coming up again. You're welcome to sign up. Um, that's just one of the ways that this North Toronto cluster of churches has had the opportunity to collaborate, and there are many others. So I invited you to think about this question about what are James and John afraid of, and what's the, what's the fear that you carry? I'll start. Uh, I realized yesterday that this is the first time that I've preached somewhere else in a very long time. I've been at Leaside United Church for over eight years now. During that time, we had one other pulpit swap with the North Toronto Cluster of Churches. I've led worship elsewhere, most recently uh, earlier this month, as I was part of uh, a leadership program that our moderator is leading with um, church leaders across the country, and I led a communion service outside, standing in the, in the frost, because <laughs> it's cold already. And um, I've led worship elsewhere, but preaching, unless you camp funerals with, you know, many people that we don't know, not really. So, uh, yeah, that's a bit of fear that I'm carrying right in this moment. Thank you be for being here with me in that. Thinking back to our scripture, what, what might be this fear that James and John carry? Anyone have thoughts right now? What might James and John, like they're saying to Jesus, give us whatever we ask. Give us anything we ask. We're not going to tell you what yet. 
right? Just, just tell us that you'll grant our request. And Jesus says, well, what is it? And I say, let us sit on your right hand and your left hand in your glory. What are they afraid of? The future, yeah. Losing Jesus. Losing Jesus, yes. Any, anything else? Not being good enough. Not being good enough, yeah. I mean, sometimes we come to this story and think, Oh, look at James and John just wanting all the glory, <laughs> right? Just, they're, just, they're just there wanting whatever they can get for themselves. But when we listen to, when we listen to the story, yes, they're, they're afraid of what's ahead. They're afraid of losing Jesus. They're afraid that maybe they're not good enough. Now, let's take a step back with James and John because James and John were some of the first four of the disciples, right? They're right up there with Peter, Peter's brother, who just sort of gets a side mention every now and then. They're right up there in the first four that just drop their nets and follow Jesus. No questions asked, no hesitation. And they're doing that right here again. This is the third time in Mark's gospel that Jesus has warned about what's to come. What's to come in Jerusalem the danger and the death that is ahead for him. The first time that he did this, Peter rebukes him. Peter says, hey, maybe you shouldn't talk so much about that being arrested and crucified part because who's going to follow you if you do that? Like, you want to start a movement, right? I mean, we're here with you. But what about, what about everyone else? That's the first time. Second time, I don't know what the disciples were thinking. Second time they hear this news, then they start arguing about who's the greatest. I don't have a, a good interpretation of that. I think that's just like, <laughs> deny, deny, deny. This time, he once again describes what's ahead for him. And James and John come forward with this question. And they say, we're right here with you. What's ahead for you? That's ahead for us too, right? We, we're going to be with you right there, and we want to know that we're going to stay with you. I like that interpretation. Like, we're afraid of losing you. We want to know that in the end, that won't be the outcome. That something else will be. That we'll be with you, and what's next? So we could call this ambition, or we could call this love. Or we could call this maybe their own fear, like they're saying that they'll be with them, but maybe they realize that we're human beings and we're fallible. They're right. They, they come with this request, and Jesus does not say no. He doesn't say yes, but he also doesn't say no. He says, are you sure you know what you're asking? This isn't going to be easy. And then he says, okay, you'll walk this road with me, but what happens afterwards is uncertain. I can't give promises about the future. All I can tell you is this message of what it means to follow me, which is to be a servant of all. So this comes to the, the, question, the second part of the question, which is, what is, the, what is the fear that you carry? You're welcome to shout some things out. What's the fear that you carry, either in your own life or in the context of Fairlawn Avenue United Church? Look at me not saying Leaside United Church. Or in the context of Fairlawn Avenue United Church or of the North Toronto cluster of churches. What's the fear? that might lead you to be like James and John, to disappear, shrink away. shrink away. Yeah. 
that what we're doing right here might not be enough to keep going. Any other fear? It's a good question. You can write it down. You can take it home to think about. What's the fear that we carry? That nobody cares? That nobody cares. That we're doing all this good work and nobody cares. Not being strong enough. Not being strong enough. For what's ahead. For what's ahead. Yeah. I wonder if James and John were feeling the same way. Like, you know, if we can, if you can guarantee the glory <laughs> at the end, then, then we know we can be strong enough. But what if we don't know? What if the future is uncertain? As it always is. As it was in Jesus' time and as it is now. How do we just keep going anyway? I love James and John as this example because they drop their nets and follow. They hear Jesus talk about how hard things are going to be and they keep going. They ask for more. (laughs) And that's, that's what we can see is this model of what we can do. Right? We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what the future is. We can be afraid of our own lack or we can be afraid of the indifference that seems to be out there in the world. And yet we keep going anyway. We keep loving anyway. We keep serving anyway. And we do this here and we do this with a much wider lens of our city and the world. Today is World Food Sunday and you'll see this reflected in the prayer that we're about to share with one another. But one of the invitations on World Food Sunday is to think about how we can turn the idea of fear into the idea of feast. One of the things that holds us back when we think about addressing global hunger is this idea of if we don't hold on to what we have, we won't have it, that there isn't enough for everyone. Maybe that's something that you're feeling or maybe that's something that uh, you hear rumblings of or that's underlying the opinions of other people in the world. And just like these fears about our future, as communities of faith, as the United Church of Canada, we have to acknowledge those fears and then let them rest and act anyway. And when we think about food and global hunger, the truth is that there is enough for everyone. The truth is that this is not a problem that cannot be solved. It's difficult, but it's not about scarcity. When we turn to God, the model that we're presented with is not scarcity, but abundance. There is enough food. There is enough hard work. There is enough love. There is enough grace. There is enough. There is enough joy. One of the things I like about the idea of a feast is because it contains all of these aspects. The promise that there's enough for everyone. Those words of abundance, that sign of generosity, all are welcome to the table. And because feasts are fun. I hear that you've been spending some time practicing having fun together. Oh, yeah? Okay. Let's do that a bit more. Right? This, this vision that we hold on to is something that's compelling because it brings joy to us. And because we know it can bring joy to others. Joy that doesn't happen only when things are easy, but joy that comes from the certainty of God's love. The certainty that we are enough. 
The certainty that spending time with other messy, complicated people makes life better. Joy. So I have a poem. By Mary Oliver. It's called Don't Hesitate. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind, and much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back that sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Will you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Compassionate God, we are filled with fear. Our fear is showing and it is not pretty. It shows up as we access health care, as we discuss political affairs, as we engage with justice issues, as we interact with people who determine to be different from us. We are afraid because we do not think there is enough love, enough resources, and enough justice to go around. Our fear has caused us to be angry and has reduced our generosity. Our sin is fear-based. Compassionate God, take away our fear. Free us to live and love with your generosity of spirit. Amen. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to pass peace with one another. I don't know how you usually do this. But I am going to suggest that we hold on to that joy is not meant to be a crumb and do this with joy. Okay? So that might mean being particularly noisy or particularly active or have particularly large smiles. This peace that we share, the peace of Christ, is one that goes beyond our understanding, one that sustains us in the midst of uncertainty, one that brings hope and joy, even in the most difficult of times, as it does in the best of times. So I say, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another with signs of the peace of Christ. All right, uh, we got a scale of joy from here to here. How do you think we did? Like here? 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 Okay, good. Keep on going. I. Uh, as, as we think about joy, we get to continue in this, in acts of generosity and thanksgiving. Whenever we present our offering, whether it's financial gifts, whether it's gifts of our time, gifts of our passions, gifts of our dreams, gifts of our physical labor, whenever we present our offering, we do it both out of a sense of commitment to this work and also a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving for all of the blessings that we have in our life. So this morning, continuing this theme, I invite you to think about the offering that we present as being an opportunity to buy in to this image of God's feast, which we do with joy. Let us present our offering. Will you join with me in prayer? O 
Holy God, we bring our hearts and our minds to you in prayer. We bring to you the fears that we carry. We bring to you the dreams that we hold. We bring to you our hopes and our worries. In this stillness, in the beating of our hearts, in the community around us, may we remember always that we are enough, that what we do matters. And that even when plans go wrong, your work is happening in ways unseen. Today we bring the prayers of our hearts, prayers for those we know and love. We pray for those of us here and elsewhere who are experiencing illness, or are wrapped in grief. We pray for those of us here and elsewhere who see an uncertain future or who are experiencing violence. We pray for those of us here and elsewhere who know hunger all too well. May we continue to do the work of your love. Holy God, we pray for your aching world. We pray with grief for the continued news of the deaths caused by airstrikes of conflict in so many places. Today on World Food Sunday, we pray in particular for the often unreported news of the impacts of hunger. Hunger caused by conflict, climate, economy, and displacement. We pray for each of the 309 million people facing acute hunger this year. In prayer and in action, may we continue to do the work of your love. Holy God, may you be with us so that our fear does not hold us back from love. May you be with us so that in each moment we can affirm the power of life, the joy of your presence, and the promise of peace which shines with the light of Christ. We pray all these things in the certainty of your presence and the warmth of your love. Amen. Your bulletin has a prayer of dedication, and I'm not going to read it. (laughs) You can just uh, put that down if you want for a moment. You are God's beloved children. You are enough. And together, the work that you are doing is meaningful. You matter. Don't be afraid of getting lost. Don't carry worry about the plans not working out. Don't 
catch up your hope with what happens, but hold fast in that promise of love which is beyond what we can comprehend. Wherever you go, God will be there. Take the time to notice and take the time to remember that God, the creator, source of love, Jesus Christ loves incarnation and the Holy Spirit loves power and promise is with you now and always. Amen. Thank you for watching. If you appreciate this content, please share it with your friends. Consider giving us a like, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon as it really helps our channel. And as always, be good to you.